Hey everyone, this is Mrs. Moriarty and I'm here to discuss with us topic 4.2, which is all about soil formation as well as the process of erosion. So now looking at uh, topic 4.2 and actually the next few topics, we're going to really get into, you know, what is soil, what is found in soil, how does soil form, uh, and all that jazz. Uh, so taking a look at this picture here, we can see soil has a lot of things, right? It's not just, um, it's not just dirt, right? Um, soil can have things like water, can have biological things like microbes, bacteria, uh, plant roots. Uh, it can also have inorganic items, things that are abiotic as well, such as minerals, rocks that help to make uh, form it, as well as things like sodium, potassium, nitrogen, and so on. And so soil is going to be a mixture of both living and non-living things. The non-living parts are going to be the actual geological rock that helps to build and make up that soil. Versus the organic things, those are more of the living components. Now, what you'll find in the actually next topic, we're going to talk about these three very specifically. Um, but you'll find that soil is going to be comprised of certain percentages of sand, silt, and clay. Those are three particles that help to make up what kind of soil we might be studying. Now, usually the very top layer of soil is going to contain the most organic uh, components, and that is going to be known as the humus. So this is where we see the greatest breakdown of biomass, such as leaves, twigs, or even dead animals, waste. All of that's going to be found on the very upper layer of our soil. When we go deeper into the soil, we may find inorganic substances, such as things like ammonium, phosphates, nitrates, right? Thinking back to the nitrogen cycle, phosphorus cycle, all things that plants require in order for their survival. We even find water as well as air pockets within the soil too. We'll even find living organisms, right? Such as microbes, earthworms, decomposers, tritivores. So we know that soil is going to be made up of many different parts, right? We said specifically geological rock. So what actually happens to that rock that helps to form soil? And then how might that soil move in the future? Uh, so that's going to be through two things known as weathering and erosion. And we kind of talked about this a little bit back in unit one when we talked about ecological succession and how an ecosystem forms simply from bare rock. So this kind of comes back up again. So weathering is the breakdown of rocks into much smaller pieces, and that can be done physically, usually through wind, rain, right? maybe even the thawing and freezing of ice. Could be done biologically, so the roots of trees can actually break rock, cause fractures, and crack them. Or it can be done chemically through maybe acid rain or other acids produced from pioneer species such as mosses and lichens, right? Remember, those species come in, they're the first ones to occupy an unused uh, ecosystem space that's simply just bare rock. They release uh, chemicals that help to break down that rock. Now that weathering of rock, whether it be physical, biological, or chemical, over time is going to create a soil layer. It breaks it down into smaller and smaller pieces, and eventually they can get carried away and deposited by erosion. So erosion is going to be the transport of any weathered rock fragments via wind or rain. They can be carried to maybe new locations and deposited. So how does the soil form from top to bottom and vice versa? Looking at below, weathering of the parent material, that's going to be known as the actual bedrock that originally formed that ecosystem, produces smaller and smaller fragments that are going to help to make up the geological makeup of that soil. So you can see the bedrock in this image here is all the way down here. So this is the original bare rock. Here you can see little fractures made within the rock, and that's due to the weathering over time. 
Now what that's going to produce is percentages of sand, silt, and clay, as well as minerals. But from above, we can see the breakdown of organic matter, right, like things like living things, are going to add humus to the soil from above, and erosion can wind up depositing any soil particles from one area to another. So now when we start to get the weathering of that bedrock, how do those soil horizons wind up creating layers? Well, you need to 100% know these soil horizons, so I would store this in your notes. Starting with the first layer, we said that that's the layer with the most organic material, the greatest amount of humus. That's known as the O horizon. So this is where we see uh, plant roots, dead leaves, animal waste, and so on. This is going to provide nutrients. Uh, it can also limit uh, water loss to evaporation here as well. When we go below the O horizon, this is now known as the topsoil. So this is going to be more humus. This is going to be more of that decomposed matter, though. So now a lot of the uh, dead animals, waste, leaves have now fully decomposed and kind of returned back into the soil. So this is where we see some minerals from parent material, too. So there's like a mixture of the two. So the A horizon, because all of this is happening here, has the most biological activity. So this is where we tend to see microbes. We see earthworms, right? They're furthering, breaking down any of the organic matter from the O horizon. When we go below the A horizon, we get to the subsoil, or known as the B horizon. It's actually a lighter layer right below the topsoil, mostly made of the minerals. Little to no organic material is here. Now, in some cases, and you can see this in the picture here, there can also be an E horizon. This is what's known as the alluviation layer. This is where we can see a lot of accumulation of metals um, happen here. And in some cases, depending upon what kind of soil we might be looking at, it can occur either beneath the O horizon or beneath the A horizon. Now, looking at our B horizon, we said that this is the subsoil. This is going to be mostly made of minerals. It contains some nutrients. And then towards the bottom there, we get the C horizon. This is going to be the least weathered soil. It's closest to what the parent material would be called um, at that point. Now, going below the C horizon, you would get what's known as the R horizon, and that is the actual bedrock itself. <clears throat> So why is it so important to understand what we find in each soil horizon and how weathering erosion play a role in all of this? Well, it's important when we go to grow crops or, or maybe even raise animals to then have them eat on crops. Um, depending upon how we treat that agricultural field can over time impact the nutrient level and soil fertility. When we use a um, method known as tilling, where we turn over the agricultural field, what happens is we get a loss of that top soil layer because now we're disturbing the soil, making it far more easier to be carried away via wind or rain. When we see a loss of top soil, what's gonna wind up happening is nutrients will be removed Soil organisms that are usually found in that A horizon are now no longer there and they're no longer able to cycle all those nutrients, all that organic matter. We can also see compaction. So when we're using very heavy machinery or, or even putting livestock um, on an agricultural field as well, that's going to create compression. And what that does is it reduces the soil's ability to hold any moisture. It causes then greater amounts of soil erosion as well. With greater amounts of soil erosion, we can support less plants, less root structure. So it kind of uh, creates this whole positive feedback loop where we continue to create more soil erosion and less plants are able to reside there. 
and then overall nutrient depletion. When we go and plant the same crops over and over again every single year, that means those crops are only going to want right certain nutrients. So we're going to deplete the um, soil of those specific nutrients every single time we wind up doing that. So what this does is it reduces the soil's ability to grow any future crops. All right, folks, here's our practice FRQ for 4.2. Take a moment, pause the video, make sure you answer it in your FRQ journal and on the Edpuzzle. Okay, at this point, we should have answered uh, our FRQ. Here it states that students wanted to determine impacts of soil erosion from the development of new housing. They plan to measure the density of a species of algae growing along the bottom of a river that flows through their town. The town is built in a heavily forested area, but a large area of trees along the river was recently clear cut to allow for the construction of a new housing development, which has caused exposed soil to wash into the river. The river flows north to south through the town and is still forested both up and downstream of the town. So here you had to identify a control group of this experiment and identify the dependent variable of this experiment. The correct answer was as follows. For a control group, remember that's the group that's going to be compared to the experimental so it doesn't necessarily experience the independent variable. Here it states a water sample collected from just downstream of the northern forest has not been contaminated by any runoff from the construction project since it's upstream from the construction site. So there is less erosion happening in that area so it's a good spot to compare. The dependent variable in this case was the measuring of the density of algae along the bottom of that river. All right, everyone, that's it for our video on 4.2. If you have any questions, please leave it at the end of the video.